You're listening to Hear Arizona. Addressing issues, empowering our community. What do Dwight Eisenhower, John F. Kennedy, Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, and George H.W. Bush all have in common? Yes, they were 20th century presidents, but they also all served in the military. Eisenhower was a five-star general. Kennedy was a World War II hero who was credited with saving the lives of the men on the patrol boat he commanded. George Bush was the youngest fighter pilot in Navy history. They all came from a generation of leaders who were forged on the battlefields of the Pacific and Europe during World War II. But there is a new generation of leaders who served in Iraq and Afghanistan, who serve now in political positions, ranging from high-level cabinet leaders like Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg, down to local school boards and city councils. Several serve in Congress. The veteran community represents an often untapped reservoir of political talent. They swear an oath to the Constitution at an early age, and oftentimes working in politics represents an extension of that oath. They're capable of sacrifice, compromise, and know how to work with people. The hard part is just getting them engaged in a political environment where many veterans feel like no politician, regardless of party, cares about them or their issues beyond using them as props in speeches. In this episode, I spoke with Aaron Marquez, He currently serves on the Phoenix Union High School District Governing Board. He also manages the group Vets Forward, a nonpartisan but progressive-leaning organization that gets veterans to engage in the world of politics. Tell me about your time in the Army and uh, what made you decide to do that versus anything else. Uh, Thanks so much for having me here today, Scott. Uh, I've been in the Army Reserve uh, since 2009. Uh, I'm currently a, a major in the Army Reserve. Uh, work as a civil affairs team leader. Uh, I deployed twice to Afghanistan. And for me, joining the Army uh, was really something I felt like was a generational responsibility. I wasn't sure if I supported the wars in Iraq or Afghanistan when 9 11 happened. Um, but after uh, watching so many of my peers from high school and college uh, go on to serve in the military, uh, I felt like it was something I needed to do to say I, I did my part. Uh, I signed up in 2009, really uh, at the very beginning of the Obama administration and the surge in Afghanistan, um, and, and thought I would do one deployment and say I did my part and, and be done with it. But you know, 12 years later, I'm still a Army reservist doing one week in a month, and I've been to Afghanistan twice and spent some time on active duty. and. Uh, you know, have a lot more responsibility as a major now, uh, leading troops that have never uh, been to war yet. So for those that are listening and aren't really familiar with military terminology, what is civil affairs? Uh, civil affairs is really the, the part of the military that oftentimes is, is unknown to the, the rest of the public. Um, but our, our mission is really about winning hearts and minds in combat situations all over the world, wherever we might deploy the armed forces. Uh, so in Afghanistan, while I was deployed, uh, a lot of that work looked like going into villages uh, every week, talking with village elders and district governors, and really trying to identify ways that we can support the local community um, in order to support, uh, at, the, at that time, uh, the, the government of Afghanistan that we, w- we would like to have seen succeed in Afghanistan. Um, so a lot of those projects that I was able to work on after meeting with village elders and district governors were... Uh, schools for for the the children of Afghanistan and specifically the the girls of Afghanistan, uh, healthcare clinics, uh, road reconstruction projects, uh, just you know the basic construction of uh, civ- civic and government buildings for the the district governors and the district offices so that government could function, especially in some of these very rural communities within Afghanistan. Okay, so that was what you did on your two Afghanistan deployments was mostly uh, winning hearts and minds by building civil affairs projects for them? So I, I deployed twice to Afghanistan. Okay. The, the first deployment uh, was very civil affairs focused. I'm cross-trained. I'm also an army intelligence officer. My second deployment to Afghanistan, I went to southern Afghanistan to Kandahar uh, and supported uh, uh, a joint task force uh, conducting counterterrorism operations. So two very different deployments. One deployment, I got to get out into the communities and meet with village elders and do really amazing work. Uh, The other deployment, 
uh, was much later uh, in the war from 2016 to 2017. It was really supporting uh, advise and assist missions, trying to put the Afghan special forces out front uh, to do counterterrorism operations. I didn't get to leave the base on that deployment. It was it was very much writing the intel reports and justifying sending U.S. troops to go out on those missions. So after you finished your tours of duty in Afghanistan, how long were you on active duty after that before you officially got out and entered the world of politics? Yeah. So, you know, my, my life as an Army reservist has really been I think defined by the cliche of being a citizen soldier. You know, I, I, I went to basic training. I went to army, uh, officer school. I, I went to OCS. I came back to Arizona. I worked, uh, for Arizona's attorney general at the time, Terry Goddard, uh, in 2010 when he ran for governor. Uh, after that deployment, I ended up in Afghanistan in 2012, came home, uh, to Arizona in 2013. And I ran for state Senate, uh, so my first taste of being a candidate myself, I, I came up short in that race. Um, went back to Afghanistan from 2016 to 2017. Uh, came home for a quick break, but then went on active duty and, and worked at the U.S. Embassy in Guatemala doing civil affairs work, uh, working with the ambassador there to, to brief him on the, the projects that the Army civil affairs teams were doing in conjunction with the Guatemalan Army uh, to, to do uh, – a lot of uh, medical civic action products, setting up medical clinics throughout the very rural regions of, of Guatemala along migrant pathways. Um, and after that active duty assignment, came home to Arizona, uh, ended working in, uh, in, in work to, around the state legislature. And that work around the state legislature allowed me to get veterans more involved in talking about the importance of defending democracy and uh, why defending democracy is really important to very local races. And it, it's, it's, it's not just the prioritization that we often see in U.S. politics focused on presidential and U.S. Senate races. So you're saying the emphasis should be, your people should pay more attention to local races when it comes to you know politics as opposed to the big national races? I, I, I really think it should be both. Um, and you know I've ran for state legislature and I've ran for school board. Uh, this last election cycle, I, I, I also ran for school board. I'm a you know, sitting member of the Phoenix Union High School District Governing Board. I think school board, city council, state legislature, in, a, in so many ways, that's where the rubber meets the road. And in so many ways, that's where, if you look specifically at the state legislature here in Arizona, uh, the, the conditions uh, for the undermining of democratic values we've seen in Arizona at our state legislative level, we've seen with folks that are running for secretary of state happening right now, you know, those folks got their, their start in the state legislature. And I think it's those folks... Um, that represent the most partisan extreme elements of conservative ideology that has led to uh, the undermining of democratic principles at the highest levels of government, especially during the previous administration, uh, during the Trump administration. Absolutely. So you obviously are a veteran. You're engaged in politics. What makes a military veteran a good candidate for any sort of public office? You know, I think... Uh, I think those of us that have served the country, um, you know, think about, you know, what are the the basic principles and values that we we fought for in the military? Uh, we swore an oath to uh, defend the Constitution and the, the the values enshrined in our Constitution. And I think we can really, as as service members and veterans, uh, we can think about, you know, what does it mean to be a servant leader? And you know, I think another part that I certainly have learned in the military, you know, I'm a very progressive. Army veteran and still an Army major, um, but we work across lines of difference. You know, we meet people from all over the country, from all different backgrounds, rich and poor, and conservative and progressive. And I and I really truly believe that the military is one of the most, if not the most diverse institution in our country. Uh, represents the diversity of the country as well. I mean, yeah, from my experience, I grew up in the Arcadia neighborhood. I was one of many white guys in my high school class. And I think the first time I really ever interacted with people other than middle class white folks was when I was in the Navy. And I think that that diversity is something that's not really touched on a lot in, in discussion about the military. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, uh, you know, I think I think sometimes you hear in the Army or the Marines, you know, there's only green Marines. You know, once you you enter the service, you're, uh, you know, the, for, you know, the Army command structure actually calls it indoctrination. You go to the training and doctrine command when you go to basic training. And the military does a great job of, of breaking you down and uh, making you a soldier, whether that's in the Marines, the Navy, the Army, whatever branch you decide to serve in. Um, but oftentimes, uh, 
as we think about our veterans community, um, I think there's a false narrative that veterans are a conservative, monolithic voting gro- voting block of, of people, um, veterans and military families. And I think that's an absolutely false narrative that you know veterans need to challenge and 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 let the rest of the country know that you know vef- veterans represent the entire political spectrum. And I think what we've seen, especially over this last year, and especially uh, as we've seen uh, the investigations uh, and charges come out of the January 6th in, uh, insurrection, you know, unfortunately, you know, there's there's a challenge within the military as well of of, of rooting out uh, some really extreme behaviors within the military. So those of us that, you know, really take to heart the Constitution and the democratic principles that we are fighting to defend uh, need to make sure we use our voices, uh, especially as veterans um, now that we can. Uh, I know, you know, while you're on active duty or currently serving, uh, you know, veterans, you know, for, for very good reasons, have to be careful about how uh, veterans engage in politics or active duty service members engage in politics. Yeah, you see a lot of people getting in trouble for going to rallies in uniform um, or, you know, throwing up hate symbols in uniform. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, it can be hard for people who are in the military to express genuine political views, I think. Um, how does that change when you get out? You know, do you talk to a lot of veterans when they get out? They're like, I'm ready to be political. I'm ready to make a difference. I think some some veterans, you know, as they retire or get out of the service, you know, carry sort of that independent mindset into their lives as civilians. Um, but certainly uh, veterans uh, have plenty of issues that affect veterans specifically, uh, but certainly issues that affect everyone as they transition from military life to civilian life. So I think that the challenge is, you know, how do we get veterans um, to see themselves as civic leaders in our communities as they come home? How do we get the communities to see veterans as, as civic leaders and to give them a way to meaningful to, to meaningfully engage in our democratic processes at the very local level um, to impact uh, their local communities, but also to have an impact on you know statewide uh, issues and, um, you know, the work that the the president and the occupant of the White House uh, engages in. And we, we saw veterans certainly do that uh, this year um, with the advocacy work that veterans uh, engaged in uh, to support Afghan uh, interpreters and allies uh, get to the United States. And we certainly saw veterans um, under the previous administration very active and engol- involved in, in calling out the um, undermining the democratic principles and utilizing the military and national guard uh in uh very legitimate civil protesting environments in washington dc and across the country i can think of a bunch of names alexander vinman even general mattis calling that out so your organization you work with vets forward um what does that do i know that you engage veterans in political canvassing you use them to um Basically, you get veterans engaged in political canvassing. Can you talk about how your organization finds veterans and how it teaches them to become more politically active? Yeah, so Vets Forward uh, was born uh, in 2019. Uh, Very much started uh, our programming with a a concept called deep canvassing. Uh, Deep canvassing is an approach to to knocking on doors and having face-to-face conversations with your neighbors. that is different than traditional political canvassing uh, and campaign operations where you're trying to hit as many doors as possible. Uh, With the deep canvassing methodology, it's really focused on having long conversations and building genuine connections with their neighbors and really trying to undercover, uh, you know, what are the things that they value and and make a connection to them so that they can see maybe the way they voted in the past has uh, conflicted with their actual values. Um, so, so in order to do that work, uh, you know, we recruited a staff of, of veterans last uh, in 2019. Uh, those veterans, you know, did old fashioned sort of boot leather organizing. And uh, if you're organizing for a political candidate or cause, you generally could reach out and call everybody. But we tried to sort of narrow our our list of creating concentric circles of veterans we knew working with veteran nonprofit organizations, we knew to find veterans that were, you know, aligned with wanting to make a difference in the country and get out and, and talk to voters. Um, we 
we allowed veterans to come in and, and do what's called a, a deep canvassing storytelling workshop. And through storytelling workshops, veterans can really start to discover their, their parts of their personal story um, that might resonate with a voter and a way to talk to voters uh, and, and, and listen to voters really mo mo most importantly um, by telling their personal stories and getting that voter to open up and reciprocate. So t walk me through a typical day when you take veterans out canvassing. Um, yeah, so I, I would say the other challenge of deep canvassing, if you do deep canvassing well, um, is, is your, when you, when you choose to conduct a deep canvassing operation, you're, you're deliberately talking to people, uh, that might be on the other side of the issue. Um, and so a lot of the deep canvassing that we did during the last election cycle, 2019 and 2020, was really going into these very tough turf Republican areas and talking to voters, uh, registered independents and registered Republicans about why, uh, as veterans, you know, we wanted to encourage people to think about voting for a Democratic candidate. Um, so that was our work last election cycle. Uh, the work that we're focused on this election cycle is a little bit more is, is more nonpartisan. We're a 501c4 entity this election cycle. And it's really getting veteran voices engaged um, at this point, not in the deep canvassing efforts, but in writing letters to the editor, uh, producing you know videos that they can post on their social media accounts to talk about issues that matter to veterans and military families, and supporting things like the child tax credit, uh, supporting things like the Brandon Act. Uh, the Brandon Act is a, is a piece of legislation that Senator Kelly uh, co-sponsored that basically allows service members uh, in the active duty or on the reserves to go to their commander and say, I have a Brandon Act issue. And that means they have a mental health care concern that they'd like to speak with a, a, a mental health uh, professional about. Uh, in the military, we know that, you know, before the Brandon Act, there wasn't always the cover for service members to go seek out mental health care treatment. And oftentimes it would come with stigma and ostracization and also um, could impact their career promotion potential. Yeah, I think the previous episode talks in detail about the trauma that veterans face when they're in the service and then the difficulty they have accessing any sort of mental health care because of the stigma around that. And then, you know, if you're on SSRIs, you can't carry your weapon. You can't, you know, have access to classified material. So it really does impact careers. Um, and this act sounds like it would be really beneficial to these people. So. What power does having a veteran share a political message have on the average American voter? You know, I would say because of our service and because of our sacrifices, uh, the American public, for, for, for whatever reason, you know, there's a high amount of trust that we get off the bat uh, when we announce that we're veterans. Um, so when a veteran knocks on your door and, uh, you know, is wearing a hat that says, I'm a veteran of the war in Afghanistan or the war in Iraq, or oftentimes we have Vietnam era veterans knocking on doors with us as well. Um, that voter immediately gives that messenger an opportunity to, to say what they want to say. Uh, so much of the challenges in all of the door knocking that I, I did before I was a veteran and when I'm, I've been knocking on doors for candidates and not really identifying myself as a veteran, the hardest part of having a conversation with somebody is getting through the first 15 to 30 seconds so that a person's willing to engage. And what I would say, you know, whether it's knocking on doors, engaging on camera, or through written communication, veterans automatically get a little bit of trust that most Americans don't get when trying to engage in a political conversation. And you still might walk away from that discussion and say, we're going to agree to disagree, but at least we can start to have conversations with our neighbors about these important issues that are dividing our country. So does it work? I believe so. Um, you know, the, the, the research on deep canvassing shows that, you know, one in 10, vet, one in 10 deep canvassing conversation can re result in, in meaningful change when it comes to issues relating to prejudice, uh, specifically around LGBT issues. And we were able to do some testing last election cycle uh, with online focus groups that showed if you put a message in front of a, a group of voters about, you know, a voter with a, uh, an Arizonan with a pre-existing condition uh, struggling and why we need our elected officials to stand up to protect folks with pre-existing conditions. And he ran a very similar script with that exact same 
individual who is also a veteran, and you you add into that script that you know I'm a veteran with a pre-existing condition, uh, it definitely shows that 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 video, uh, if somebody is self-identifying as a veteran, performs better, especially with independent and conservative voters. But voters across the board, you know, trust uh, the veteran as a messenger. As opposed to just some average organizer who's knocking on the door, doesn't have that military experience. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And I think that's because of our service. Um, people know that if you, whether you deployed or not, uh, you, you wrote a blank check to serve the country and uh, to serve the country knowing that, you know, whether you were an infantryman or, uh, you know, an AGR or, a, you know, adjutant general HR officer, you know, there's always a risk when you join the military. And, and I think every American that hasn't served in the military knows that, you know, when you sign up um, and you become a veteran, that, you know, that, that means that that person has put their life on the line for the safety and security of our country, regardless of the political decisions of our political leaders about, you know, where, where they might send us or is if there's legitimate reasons for us to be in those other countries. So there is this longstanding kind of stereotype that people in the military tend to be more conservative. In your estimation, I mean, obviously the military is a huge dichotomy of the society. Yeah. Would you say politically it's a pretty fair dichotomy of society as well? Yes, yes, absolutely. I, I would say historically... In my experience, you know, my 12 years in the, in the service, um, it probably leans a little bit to the right, but I don't think it leans nearly as much to the right as the conventional wisdom projects. Um, I, I do think it is the most diverse institution in the country, and it does represent the diversity of the country. I would say under the previous administration, um, you know, based on the comments that the former president made about Senator McCain uh, and service members, um, I would say it started to swing a little bit the other way to the left. Um, and, you know, it's really up for grabs right now about which party uh, is going to to make sure that they show veterans um, the support that they need, especially now that we've ended uh, the war in Afghanistan. It's, it's, it's an opportunity for the country and for the places like the state of Arizona to say, you know, we want to become the most veteran-friendly state in the country. We want to be the state that attracts veterans because we know that there's civic assets and resources to our universities. And we want to make sure there's job training programs for veterans to come home to Arizona. Um, and so I think both parties really have an obligation uh, to make sure they're doing those things, whether it's health care, uh, education for their children. You know, veterans want to raise their children in places um, that they know their kids can succeed. And it's making sure that veterans, uh, you know, have jobs to, to come home to. Excellent. So what's what's in the future for you personally as a political veteran and for your organization that does the canvassing and creates the uh, you know the videos and stuff? Well, yeah. What's next? Well, uh, you know I'm on the school board, so I got three more years uh, working with Phoenix Union High School District. Um, you know my my motivations there are you know I'm a dad and I'm a veteran and my daughter's seven years old and I want to do everything I can to make sure the high schools uh, are as good as possible by the time that she gets to high school. And I also want to make sure that, um, you know, any veterans that, that live in Phoenix have an amazing place to send their kids to high school. Uh, with Vets Forward, I would say, you know, what's next is, you know, continuing to, to make sure that within the Arizona ecosystem, that veterans are a consistent and persistent, you know, part of the dialogue here. Uh, we had a chance uh, just a few weeks ago to release a report with the Grand Canyon Institute uh, about the impact of the American Rescue Plan on veterans. You know, the report shows that 80% of, you know, veterans received a stimulus check. Uh, it shows that, you know, the child tax credit is an incredible value for veterans. You know, one in 10 Arizona, uh, in Arizonans are veterans, and that's higher than the national average in other states. And so it only makes sense that veterans' voices are consistently heard in a Arizona, and that happens at every level of government, whether it's, you know, helping veterans get involved and maybe some of those veterans think about running for school board or some of those veterans, you know, knock on doors and talk about the issues that matter to them that are impacting them at the state legislature or, you know, with our federal delegation as well. Okay. Is there anything else do you think the uh, audience of this podcast should know? What's important? I would say the most important thing uh, to think about 
in this moment in our country's history um, is that democracy, in my view, is really on the line. Um, you know, with January 6th, you know, we saw political rhetoric so extreme manifest itself into physical violence. And that is, you know, in, in, in my 39 years on this planet, I never thought I would see our country tear apart like it, it did on that day. And I think it's really important to know that um, that fight to defend democratic principles is a fight that, you know, every generation needs to engage in. And, and at this moment in history, I think it's more important that all of us come together to figure out how to combat those forms of extremism. And I would say to any veterans listening to the, this podcast is that we would want you to get involved in an organization that looks like Vets Forward so you can find your voice, utilize your voice, and find other veterans uh, to share your experiences with to, to get back some of that camaraderie that you might uh, have found in the military. All right, Major Aaron Marquez, I had you down as captain, but congratulations on the promotion. Major Aaron Marquez, member of the uh, Phoenix Union High School District Board and uh, Executive Director of Vets Forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Scott. I, sh I should add a disclaimer. I am a major in the Army Reserve, uh, but as a reservist, I have to make sure to say, you know, my political beliefs represent me alone and do not represent the Department of the Defense. Thank you All so right. much, Scott. Thank you, Aaron. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Here, Arizona is a production of the Division of Public Service at Rio Salado College, which includes Sun Sounds of Arizona, Spot 127, KBOC, and KJZZ. This podcast series is made possible by a grant from the Nina Mason Pulliam Charitable Trust and support from listeners like you. Thank you. This episode was produced, written, directed, and hosted by Scott Bork. Linda Pastore is our executive producer. Thanks for listening.